This is Duke University. Thanks for uh, taking the time to listen to some of the work we've been doing. I talk fast, so hopefully this won't take the whole five minutes. I do have several slides. <laughs> so I'm going to be talking a little bit about some of the updates on one of our more mature projects that we have um, focused on sort of bioconversion. So what we do in our lab is we basically like to take microbes and treat them as biocatalysts, and we engineer them to do different things. So converting sugars, um, carbon dioxide, even natural gas in one of our projects to different useful chemicals whether they be pharmaceuticals or bioactives in the biomedical space or nanomaterials, chemicals, and even biofuels. So what we do is basically take DNA, manipulate enzymes, which manipulate the bacteria or yeast. We grow those up into big, big cultures, and then eventually we commercialize them in large industrial tanks. So this would be similar to a biofuel process. And ideally, to replace the whole barrel of oil, we would be looking at using renewable feedstocks um, in this project from corn, sugarcane, or even cellulose and converting them not only to biofuels, but other higher value chemicals as well. And part of this, um, the DOE replacing the whole barrel of oil, is actually to make the biomass more valuable to help reduce the costs of the biofuels um, long term. And really, the, the history of the space for these types of processes has really relied on the optimization of these microbes in a fermentation process. And so if you look at this, um, let's see if I get this here, this would be sort of the performance that you need to hit to hit a commercial level. Um, and it takes a lot of time, traditionally, right? So you have sort of proof of concept level, chassis or host strain engineering, which would be the microbial strain engineering. And then you have a product-specific optimization range where you're talking about a specific process and a specific product where it'd be a biofuel or a chemical. And traditionally, in this space, it's taken almost $100 million in a decade to, to kind of optimize a bug or a microbe for this step. So one of our um, funders has, has wanted us to basically jump this curve and greatly reduce that set of costs so that we can envision you know, $10,000 in months to get through this stage for any different product and any different process. So we'd like to dramatically reduce the cost timelines and expertise in particular needed for these types of efforts to make these microbes and these biocatalysts. So we're doing this with the technology that we call dynamic metabolic control. So what you see here is the concept, the concept of, our, of our technology. Basically, the black line is the number of bacteria, number of yeast, so the amount of biomass. And it grows over time because they eat the sugar and they eat other things. They're, one of the things they're eating is a limiting nutrient. So one of the nutrients that they eat that then ends up getting exhausted by the time they stop growing. And we use that exhaustion of that nutrient as a cue to sort of turn over their metabolism. So what we can do is basically turn over their product genes or enzymes. So turn on the enzymes and pathways required to make the product that you want to make. So all those little catalysts in the cell. And we can degrade the ones that are required for growth. And if you want to talk more about it, we have several different ways we're approaching this. If you're a biologist, we're using both RNA targeting as well as uh, protein targeting to, to turn these things over. Um, so we'd like to show this, and we did this with two different colored proteins rather than enzymes. So one being a uh, red fluorescent protein and one being a green fluorescent protein. And in this case, we're trying to turn this one on and turn this one off. So basically, we have time. We grow up our biomass, which would be the black line. Um, and then ideally, we would have the red protein get turned over and get degraded, and the green protein get turned on. And we um, have a culture that's red turned culture that's green. And actually, this is exactly the, what happens when we do this. So we're able to dynamically control um, not only um, Red, red and green proteins, but also essential enzymes. So we're able to take a metabolic network, which would be very complex. So each of these would be different molecules in the cell, and each of these would be enzymes connecting those different molecules. And we're able to basically now, and with our technology, we can basically knock out most of it and really greatly simplify what we're dealing with to optimize these microbes to make what we'd like to make. So we basically built in many different test pathways over the last year, so 15 to 20 that we've, we've demonstrated this technology with. What you see here is sugar. These are different sort of metabolites in the cell. So the cell converts the sugar to these different metabolites. And each of these blue products is a different product that we're trying to make. And each of the genetic microbes that we've engineered have different sets of changes for each of these different products. But ideally, we have one process for everything. So basically, that's what it turns out to be. So we have one process where we grow up the biomass to a certain level. And then we're able to make lots of different products in the fermentation. So what you see here is the level of the product that we're making over time. Same process, multiple microbes. And really, anything above this level starts to get to the point where we're looking at commercializing and scaling up these products for um, next steps for chemicals and fuels. So basically, most of these are in the chemicals range. So we have things that would be into going to synthetic or renewable rubbers, um, plastics and resins, some adhesive molecules, and then obviously some amino acids and things that would go into nutrition. And so I've shown you one example of what we're doing with renewable sugars into chemicals. 
We're also following up this on and taking this into renewable biofuels and hopefully in, a, in another presentation in six months or no, we'll have more data to talk about carbon dioxide and natural gas. So with that, I'd like to briefly thank, very briefly, all the people who actually made this work. So um, <clears throat> I'll be speaking, as David already uh, announced, uh, about the computational side. So I call this materials for energy conversion by a computational approach. I joined the MEMS department about one and a half uh, years ago, so I'm also not, also not at Duke uh, very long, but I'm excited to see the uh, um, activity going on on the energy side. So that's what I'd like to connect to. So the energy material side, in our case, um, means mostly uh, materials properties that uh, are relevant to uh, light, uh, to energy conversion in some usable form, such as electrical energy or fuels. I'll say a few words about the uh, theoretical approach that we use, mainly what it can do, and then just mention briefly some of the materials examples that are being studied in our group, and then finally talk about or um, introduce a new energy initiative project that's uh, done together and led, in fact, by David Mitzi on defect engineering and photovoltaic materials um, that um, is about to begin at this point. So this slide is probably one that I don't have to uh, say very much about. I'm showing this um, various uh, sunlight to energy conversion examples because each of them is in some way connected to uh, materials questions underneath. And photovoltaics, that would be uh, um, um, traditional or new semiconductor materials that we can optimize or um, invent. In solar thermal energy, one of the uh, uh, long-standing problems was molten salts, for instance, that are used for thermal uh, storage until you can uh, use the thermal energy that you've collected to uh, create electrical energy. Then there's the whole side of uh, uh, direct conversion uh, of sunlight to um, fuels. Hydrogen evolution is the prototypical example. But for that, you need a catalyst material to make that work um, efficiently. And we are not at the stage where this is economically viable just yet at this point. And then there are other things that I would here refer to as dream processes in a way, because we're really far away, as far as I know anyway, uh, from realizing them, which is to basically take uh, CO2 from the atmosphere, use sunlight and a, a suitable uh, catalyst, and uh, do CO2 re reduction that way uh, to a fuel such as methane. But all these questions are questions that involve materials. And uh, from a computational point of view, what we can do and what we actually do is to solve Schrodinger's equation, which is shown in its very short form here. If you want to talk to me later, I can give you the long form. <laughs> but the key point is that we have computers and we can do accurate computational predictions these days of properties of what I call here ideal materials. These are uh, materials models that go up to perhaps several thousands uh, of atoms at most uh, in the material. But they give us access to basic uh, materials properties that are the properties of the ideal material if we could, could make them. And that can range from phase stability. So can you make a, a given material at all? Just because I've drawn this here doesn't actually prove that you can make it or that it exists in nature. It could do something very different. Order, disorder, defect properties, and the electronic influence. Um, uh, 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 electronic properties such as uh, uh, band structure, effective masses of carriers or dielectric properties can go into models of transport, can go to uh, reaction mechanisms in chemistry, and so on. So in our group, one thing that's out there on a poster is the Energy Initiative uh, Supported Project on uh, Carbon Supported Earth Abundant Hydrogen Evolution Catalysts. We also work on graphitic carbon nitride materials for uh, uh, photocatalytic hydrogen evolution, which is with a group in Munich. And then finally, this is the defect engineering project that I'll use my last two minutes uh, uh, to uh, say a few words about. This is, in fact, a, a classic uh, semiconductor question, if you will. There's a class of semiconductor materials called, based on the zinc blender structure, that um, are uh, suitable for high efficiency uh, thin film photovoltaic devices and have been used for a long time. And uh, uh, in particular, there's materials like CAD telluride that are uh, commercial or uh, CIGS, copper indium, gallium selen selenium that work. But they present a few issues such as toxic elements in the case of cadmium or expensive elements in the case of tellurium and also indium uh, to some extent. And one material that David, I think, has a, a, a great history of working on is uh, CZ -S, uh, uh, CZT SSE, which is uh, copper, zinc, tin, uh, sulfur, selenium, and the key point is that these uh, elements do not have these issues. There's a prototype solar cell, uh, also a photovoltaic device, also by David's group, I think, uh, that gives 12.6%, but there's a limit uh, to the efficiency, uh, simply due to the fact that the copper and the zinc atoms in the lattice like to switch sites, and while, while that sounds like a very small detail, it actually uh, negatively affects the electrical properties. 
so the question that we're asking is, can we use uh, synthesis and theory synergistically to devise alternative uh, zinc bladder type materials that have less detrimental defects and perhaps uh, can go higher to higher in terms of efficiency without reintroducing the toxic elements. This is just the first picture from um, David's group, actually. This is a measured band gap of a, an alternative material containing barium times up by C. So I'll just mention that uh, the band gap goes down to a range that might or might not be useful. And there's a lot of questions for us as theorists to answer with that and other materials that we'd like to investigate. Thank you very much for your attention. So, good afternoon. Um, I'm going to be talking about a novel deposition technique that's called resonant infrared matrix-assisted pulsed laser evaporation, or RIR maple. And we're using this for organic solar cells. So by organic solar cells, um, which is a photovoltaic material, um, basically talking about solar cells that are made out of plastics. So why would we be interested in that? A few reasons. Uh, one is you could use renewable materials that are green that you could easily uh, uh, synthesized for your source materials. They would be less expensive and then also have the capability to be deployed in unique ways. So we saw in Volker's talk that there were the houses there and they all had the solar cell panels. So imagine if you can make these solar cells out of plastics, you could integrate them into your home or your car or your clothing in much more um, appealing ways. So that's sort of the big idea of why you'd be interested in making solar cells out of plastics. Now the general idea of an organic solar cell is based on this idea of a bulk heterojunction where you have two different materials. One is a donor and one is an acceptor. And at the interface of these two materials, you can separate an electron hole pair. So that is, you absorb light, you absorb a photon, you create an electron hole pair. That uh, exciton has to travel to an interface between the two different materials. They're separated, and then you can collect the two different charge carriers, electrons and holes, and that's how you get your solar cell to work. So this sort of device then depends very much on the morphology of that active region, that bulk heterojunction, how well the two materials are mixed together. So in my group, we're working on this emulsion-based RIR maple. And this is a unique way to deposit these bulk heterojunction materials that involve organics. So it's a variation of pulsed laser deposition. Uh, some important differences, uh, it uses an infrared laser so that you don't damage the organic materials that you're depositing. And our target is a frozen emulsion of the materials that we want to put together for this uh, organic solar cell. Um, why is this unique? Why does it give us uh, special properties? What's really special about this is that we're essentially uh, transferring our target materials in a dry state. Right, so one of the things that's special about the plastics, you make a solution, you put it down, you let it evaporate, and that's very inexpensive and it's very cheap. Uh, but it also makes it very difficult to control the material properties because however that solvent evaporates, that dictates the properties of your film. By transferring the materials in this dry state, you get a lot more control over what's happening uh, in the film. So you can prevent the separation of your donor and acceptor materials. You don't want them to separate because their mixing is what separates your charge carrier. So you want them to have these interfaces uh, very frequently. So you can re reduce that separation of the two different materials. Also, if you'd like to put together a film that has uh, materials with different solubilities, for example, you'd like a film that has materials that are hydrophobic and hydrophilic, you can now make a thin film with those materials. Uh, and then also, if you want to make multi-layer films where the films have the same solubility, you wouldn't be able to do that with a solution-based process, but you can with the maple approach. So I'd just like to give two examples of how we're using maple then to make these organic-based solar cells. And one thing that has really been unique with the maple is to make hybrid materials. That means films where you are incorporating organic and inorganic components. So this is one, one example where we have an inorganic colloidal quantum dot combined with a polymer and we're making, uh, blending these together in films to make solar cells. The big point here is that we're showing different films that were made by solution-based processing and films that were made by maple on different scales. And these are transmission electron microscopy images. And what it shows is that for the solution-based processing, you can see very different morphology based on the type of solvent that was used. And you can see that segregation of the components. Whereas with the maple films, it's really independent of the, sol of the solvent that's used, and you have this sort of general, uh, very good mixing of the two materials. And so we're making solar cells out of these. And then as a final example, we're also starting to look at this for the perovskite deposition that we talked about. So these perovskites in particular are the hybrid perovskites. They have an organic component and an inorganic component. 
Now this isn't a bulk header junction in the sense of this organic inorganic blend, but making a bulk crystal where you have the two components. What's unique about maple is that we can deposit the organic and the inorganic parts separately. So that allows us to have a lot more control over the perovskite materials. And we're just doing some initial work with David Mitzi's group, exploring different uh, deposition temperatures and different thicknesses. And so you can see we're getting very different morphologies and we're excited to see what happens when we actually make devices. Um, and that's it, thank you. All right, good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for having me. Uh, thank you for introduction, Professor Mitzi. Uh, as you mentioned, I'm a fourth year uh, PhD student. And specifically, I'm working in nanomaterials and thin films lab, which is led by Professor Jeff Glass. And today, I'll be talking to you about some of the recent advances we've made in employing nanostructures for the electrochemical conversion and storage of solar energy. Uh, as far as the conversion is concerned, what we're interested in is in making hydrogen production a bit more sustainable, given that the current method that uh, that is used in industry uses fossil fuels as the main mechanism to produce hydrogen. The method that we're employing is known as photoelectrochemical water splitting. In short, the way it works is you have two electrodes where at least one of them is a semiconductor, therefore it's able to absorb light. And when it absorbs light, the Schottky junction that's formed forms an electric field that separates the electrons and holes. These electron hole and holes are, are key because they're the ones that are required for the two reactions required to split water. As you can imagine, one of these reactions is the hydrogen evolution reaction, and that's what takes place here at the cathode and requires two electrons. However, the reaction that we're interested in in our research is the oxygen evolution reaction, which takes place here at the anode. This one is sometimes considered to be the more sluggish and therefore rate limiting step in the reaction due to its required uh, four holes for the reaction to take place. Now, the approach that we've decided to take to develop our nanostructure makes use of an atomic layer deposition system that we built in our lab and we're proud to say is the first at Duke University. Atomic layer deposition is an extremely exciting tool to use because it allows us very precise control over the thin films that we deposit. And essentially, it's cyclic layer by layer nature allows you to deposit uh, materials over highly uh, porous, high surface area structures with extremely high uniformity and conformality. This self-limiting nature allows us to do that without blocking off more pores than we need. These pores are essential in order to maximize the overall reaction that takes place since the reaction takes place at the surfaces as shown here. In addition, by building an overall thick device, we can decouple the charge transport lengths required for the reaction from the overall depth of the film required to absorb the majority of the photons. Now, most recently, we were able to apply this to a nanostructure comprised of these transparent conductive nanoparticles shown in blue here that were coated with a photoactive layer of titanium oxide. What we found, in addition to the properties that we expected, is that our material actually was um, performing even better than the state-of-the-art rutile titanium oxide nanowires that are currently used. The conversion efficiencies as a function of wavelength here were steadily higher than those uh, that were produced by the nanowires. We ascribe this to having better charge transfer mechanisms at the surface, as well as in improved uh, conversion efficiencies in the deeper UV range. However, um, in the future, we're looking to synthesize and tune materials that are more ad well adapted to the overall solar spectrum in order to make better use of it. In addition, we're also collaborating with Professor Sauscher and Professor Bloom's group and making better hydrogen evolution uh, reaction catalysts. And then the second challenge that we're seeking to, uh, to tackle is actually uh, helping to store solar energy directly. The approach that we've used to doing this is a flexible based approach where we actually have every layer uh, compatible with manufacturing, more specifically roll to roll manufacturing. By a layer device, I mean that the first layer is going to be an organic photovoltaic layer, uh, where directly underneath the layer that we're working on is a supercapacitor or electrochemical capacitor. This is a basic uh, idea, but it's a little bit more complex as you can see here. However, it's important to note that this multidisciplinary uh, challenge uh, has all of us producing these uh, flexible roll-to-roll -roll compatible materials. However, the specific layer that I want to talk about is this supercapacitor or, or uh, energy storage layer that's comprised of graphene, carbon nanotubes, and manganese oxide. 
Um, the graphene and carbon nanotubes are probably a couple of materials that you're familiar with. Uh, we're able to make these in our lab. But more recently, we showed that we can actually make a hybrid of these two in one step. And that's really exciting because not only could we make a hybrid where the graphene sticks out as edges or foliates off of the graphene or the carbon nanotubes walls, but we can actually control the foliate density. And uh, therefore, these actual foliate density, foliates uh, then served as nucleation sites where we could deposit the manganese oxide. And we verified this by looking at TEM images. We could see that they're preferentially nucleated there. What's exciting about this is that this translated into a huge boost in capacitance or energy storage capabilities for these electrodes. Now, the graphenated carbon nanotubes are still in its infancy, and we see a lot of potential of our ability to use them for various applications outside just supercapacitors. So this is leading to other collaborations. Uh, but in short, I hope that this presentation was able to give you a quick insight into the work that we've been doing and uh, the future that we have. And um, it's important to note that all of this is based on collaborations and a multidisciplinary approach. And with that, I'd like to thank all our collaborators as well as my colleagues in the lab that were able to make this research happen. Thank you for your attention.